I'm James Polis. This is Zero Hour. Stephen Wolf is with us. He's the author of The Case for Christian Nationalism. He has a PhD in political theory from Louisiana State University and currently lives in North Carolina with his wife and four children. Count them. Welcome, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. How are you? Great, great. So the book is out. It's doing pretty well. People are taking notice. The controversy is real. The hate <laughs> is no doubt rising. Uh, how are you handling it? How does it feel? Uh, it's kind of kind of surreal. I mean, there's uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, it's one of those books that uh, I think it's the only book that I know of that received that was reviewed by all of the evangelical pub, you know outlets, and it was all negative. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it, it, I guess they're, they're still uh, they're still paying attention to it. So, but but the, the overall feedback from just the average person who's read it has been actually very positive. So it's one of those. Like Rotten Tomato situations where the, the critics love it and everyone hates it, or the everyone loves it and the critics hate it. Yeah, so, the the classic. I, that, uh, that seems like the the consensus. Elite versus the the people once yeah. again. Uh, yeah. So let's dig into that a little bit. Um, I you know I want to say coming out of the gate, um, for anyone who thinks that Christian nationalism is indeed some kind of vehicle to import the most horrible things that have ever existed in human history into American life. Uh, Glenn Beck himself did a great breakdown on uh, the, the controversy, um, rolled out you know, uh, uh, lots of examples from a list of you know, thousands that didn't make it into his, his pres presentation. Founding fathers, people from the time of the founding, you know, this stuff was bread and butter of the American founding, very broadly shared, uh, very contemporaneous, um, really, you know, not, um, not what it's made out to be by, by the, the, the critics, your critics, uh, and critics of, you know, frankly, anyone on the right who wants to make a peep about, you know, maybe uh, preserving um, some of the most precious of our past 2,000 year heritage as Christians and Americans. So uh, just setting the table there, um, you know, this is, this is not scary stuff, uh, but I think that you're pushing the conversation forward in a way that is uh, definitely not what I think a lot of Christians are used to hearing and even what a lot of Americans are used to hearing. They're used to hearing uh, a lot of apologies, you know, a lot of backtracking, a lot of like sand down the edges and make sure that Christianity is really, you know, really safe and not threatening and it is inclusive for everyone, you know, yeah. really trying to be as um, a sort of eat me last kind of, kind of voice uh, in what's increasingly a wilderness. Uh, do you feel like you have sort of a growing ranks of folks uh, rising to the occasion here, or do you feel still a little bit alone? No, so, yeah, I mean, among the institutions, the old institutions, there, there, there is negativity towards it, but they also kind of rose up in a time that kind of just accepted a lot of the, the premises of the post-World War II era. So this would include some version of secularism, maybe some Christian influence, but they, they adopted th this, this kind of mindset of, of essentially adopted secularism especially within the last 10 years. So po like with the election of Trump and ab afterwards, there was a sort of movement toward the left and acceptance of kind of the, the, the inevitable marginalization of, of Christianity uh, in, in American life. And I think what, that Christians, uh, American Christians who know their heritage, they know the history of the United States, they, they don't want to accept that. So instead of just accepting... Uh, like this sort of inevitable marginalization, they said, no, we're actually going to put forward a positive vision of what Amer an American uh, Christianity or an American Christian politics would look like. And so I think that my, my book came out at the right time uh, where people were looking for that. And we're, we're still very early. I mean, my, mine is kind of more of kind of a Calvinist reformed perspective. And there's others writing other things that are, that are similar from different theological perspectives. Uh, but uh, where th this conversation's occurring to try to say, wait, no, we need to uh, go go back to the, the heritage of faith that the United States has had from the beginning and, and before. Yeah, I want to get into the, the theology and all that stuff uh, in a minute, but but we may as well begin with the big guy himself, Donald J. Trump. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit from the book, uh, something that stood out to me. I'm sure it stood out to others. <clears throat> um, very rich and uh, and lots to talk about. 
Um, here's the quote. The probability of a great Christian prince arising in the near future seems slim, but things change quickly and the prospects of a continued domestic peace in the future are becoming unlikely. An explosion of energy might disclose to us the possibilities of Christian civil order, though in the meantime, we may need to settle for civil leaders who fail to live up to the standards of a Christian prince. How does Donald Trump fit into that? That's, I think it's a great question. So I, obviously Donald Trump is not uh, the sort of Christian prince we were we, we, we would be looking for. Um, and so there, there's Nor some Norman Vincent Peale doesn't count here? The what's that? Norman Vincent Peale doesn't count here, power of positive thinking? No. <laughs> well, I, I do, well, on the positive side, I do think that what Trump did, I, I see him as a sort of a, a, like an event in history where he shows up, he, he, he's a wrecking ball to a certain norm. And I, so I think he opened up possibilities, or I guess reopened up possibilities of political leadership that people can, and you see people try to, uh, f in some ways, follow in his footsteps, uh, um, not being exactly him, you can't really be, no one can actually be Trump except himself, but, but I think he opened up possibilities for, for political leadership that, uh, that can, can open for, what, what I describe as a Christian prince, and Americans don't like the aristocratic language, of course. They don't like the idea of a prince. But it sounds better than ma magistrate or even civil ruler. The, the idea being that he, he's not only good at politics, but he also has a certain charisma and presence to lead a people uh, to, to greatness. So I think someone like George Washington um, was the sort of leader who held the country together for decades, was, was a, a civil servant for uh, up until near the end of his life. And he led our country to greatness. And so I think uh, an American Christian prince would not be some sort of throwback to the Middle Ages, but it would be someone like a George Washington who can inspire the, the people to greatness. I mean, even, even after his death, uh, George Washington, his, his bust was on the, uh, the mantle in the living rooms of American households across the country. So he was this, this figure uh, that... Um, through every stage of that period, just brought us together. So I think that the idea of American Christian prince arising from what's now what's now happening and the kind of the possibilities opened up uh, are, are likely in the future. Um, then and that person can kind of lead us, really restore us back to the heritage that we we've had for most of our history. You know, I was looking at those numbers prepping for the show, and just you know, you, you get these evangelicals and not just evangelicals, uh, Protestants generally saying, you know, we trust Trump. What he says is true. Uh, we, you know, he's our guy. We're voting for him. And then, like the the rankings for, you know, not always their their own religious leaders, but sometimes their own religious leaders. You know, they're, they're okay. They're forty percent. You know, that's but that's probably like Trump's floor of popularity. So, you know, what do you see going on there with that split, where uh, you know a lot of a lot of really sincere and and devout Christians are just ready to go to the mat for this guy who. You know, I mean, it's it's not wrong exactly to say two Corinthians, but it did strike a lot of people as like, wait, what's going on? Um, you know, not a guy. He sort of waved the Bible around that one time. It kind of kind of didn't 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 work yeah. real well. Um, but he's got he's got those people locked in as voters. It seems. Um, what is missing from from Protestant religious leaders right now? Yeah, I think it's again. I think Trump is when the, the MAGA the idea of Amer make America great again. It it ins it inspires people to say, well, you know, our country was great, and we want it to be great again. Uh, do, do you whereas think that most means, religious uh, leaders have like they've resigned, like they've resigned to, like I said, the marginalization. And where and um, Trump, with with all his faults and errors, he he does inspire people to kind of return and uh, and yeah. So, I mean, do, do you think that that uh, that make America great again means make America Christian again for a lot of these people? Yeah, absolutely. I think I mean it means well, what that would mean would means different things to different people. But uh, but yeah, I think for for most Christians, yeah, it is the the idea the, the, for the Christian supporters of Trump. I think it's some return to some kind of Christianity, if not like an explicit official one, but something where I mean mo most even people who kind of say they want like maximal religious liberty, they'll often say that, well, Christianity is what brought us to religious liberty. And so if you don't have a, a strong presence and respect um, in society for Christianity, you're actually gonna lose religious liberty itself. So 
I think that's also part of it um, that, yeah. I mean, really just Trump brings back this more assertive type politics that's confrontational and, uh, and is, seems to genuinely love uh, the country. Um, and that's what yeah. Christians, but you don't see that. You don't, you don't, I mean, you kind of do in the Christian world among pastors, but then you also have the very, the, within the institutional side, you see the opposite of that. Well, and if you're in evangelical land, you know, there really isn't sort of like a formal church hierarchy uh, mm. that can convey that kind of gravitas uh, or authority. Um, I mean, America's been a place of heresy for a long time, uh, maybe since the beginning. Um, you know, you, you got those mainline uh, denominations or churches, uh, and it's just been a story of, of fracture. I mean, you go from uh, the founding generation to Universalist, Unitarian, Transcendentalist, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, it's just poof. It's gone. You get, get Onita, you get, you know, the, the, the early stirrings of new, new Age all the way back in the, you know, early to mid-1800s. Uh, um, how is it that uh, Protestants who want a more uh, Christian America uh, that also knows how to stand up for itself politically, um, what do you think their basis of faith is going to be that, uh, that the creed can kind of come back together after all the fracturing that's been happening? Yeah, I mean, one of the benefits of Protestantism uh, is that you can, you can recognize people's mutual legitimate faith even when it's, you don't have institutional, like a, a formal uh, institutional, um, you know, uh, like when you're not combined in any sense. Uh, so, so like a, a Baptist and a Presbyterian can get together and, and affirm each other's mutual faith. Uh, you don't have to be institutionally aligned to do that. Uh, that's not to say, of course, within within Orthodox Protestantism, there is kind of the the critic. There is the they still believe in heresy and unorthodox um, views. But I, I think what made like so within the United States, the sense in which that was the, the important part of the Protestant side was specifically that that to be Protestant, what opened up the possibility of a kind of religious liberty um, that you saw, like you said, the 19th century that included universalists and, and other kind of sects that, are, that arose within that time. Um, and, but yeah, that, that is, that, that would be, I think now that would be a challenge, but I think it, among the, the more conservative denominations uh, the, of the Presbyterians and Baptists and, and some of the Methodists and, and, and the Anglicans and maybe even the Lutherans, uh, and I think Roman Catholics as well, uh, we can, we can, uh, uh, at least among the Protestant side, I don't know about Catholics, but you can, you can affirm each other's mutual faith and you can say we're a Protestant country, we have disagreements, but we still want it to be Christian. And uh, that, that's, as I, as, I under, as I read history of the 19th century, I think early 20th century, even right up in the World War II era and, and right after that, there was a sense in which we are a Christian people meant that we have our disagreements and yet we're still going to... Uh, we're still going to consider ourselves a Christian nation. Are you worried at all that America just isn't Christian enough anymore to get where you want to go? Yeah, that, that is a legitimate uh, concern uh, that their religiosity in some places is very low. There's, the, as I understand, the rise of the, the nuns, like the, as in people who don't identify with any religion. N-O-N-E. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that, that being said, uh, there are, I think, at least in the short term, I think there, the, within, the, within different states where there still is high religiosity, where there still is a, uh, at least self-identified uh, profession of faith or belief in Christianity, these states, because of our federal system, states can actually act um, pretty strongly um, in favor of uh, at least Christian values um, and, and Christian truth. Uh, and so... Yeah, and I, I mean, I do think that, yeah, re, re returning, just like Israelites of old, when they, when they fall from the faith, there is this restoration uh, that, that God brings upon the, the people. And so, yes, there is a sense in which we, it's not just political power, it's not just social power, it's not just kind of earthly means. There has to be uh, some kind of revival, and that's ultimately from God. Uh, um, but, but at the very least, there is, I think, in the United States, a heritage of faith that we can appeal to and say we were a Christian nation or we are kind of latently a Christian nation, and with the movement of God, we can return to that. Well, I think you're certainly right that, you know, that some, some areas of the country are clearly more Christian than others at this point, uh, whether it's for a longer period of time or just kind of where the people are at 
right now. Uh, but when you're talking about the nuns, um, some of these folks are do really seem to be uh, content to stop at no God. But a lot of them seem to have just blown right past that marker and are busy discovering new gods, whether it's technology or uh, wokeness or a particular you know, racial cast of their imagination that can sweep into power and make all these decisions about who gets what number of reparations and totally restructure society. I think a lot of people who are, style themselves as, as woke are really making a god of justice, that it's you know, sort of idolizing the idea of justice and perfect justice. Uh, which is obviously, you know, that's that's a, a part of, of God, no doubt, is that he is a just God. Uh, but when you peel off any one of these things and try to turn it into its own God, that's going to be a very dangerous thing. And so I think like a lot of these, you know, a lot of these nuns are not quite as as as, uh, as em- devoid or emptied out of, of uh, religious devotion as they might appear or even as they might style themselves. And so we, you know, I think what we're seeing is... Um, not just a, a danger that Christianity is going to be emptied out among the people in some important respects, uh, but that we're getting a sort of new established religion. Uh, you can see it in the way, you know, whether it's DEI or ESG or uh, uh, social justice, you'd be like, whatever banner you want to wave over this movement. Um, we are uh, facing an administration and a regime that is codifying um, its, uh, its judgments about ultimate questions that penetrate down to the soul of a person uh, into law and enforcing those laws uh, and oftentimes enforcing them against Christians. So how much do you worry about that, that even in places where Christians are in relatively good shape and are interested in moving in the direction that you describe in the book and have the sort of wherewithal to do so, uh, that they're really just painting a big target on their backs? Yeah, and that, that is one, one of the fears I have. Uh, I mean, you, you just see how, how the laws being brought against people considered, who are considered dissidents uh, and and if uh, I think anything that's going to be anyone who's going to call themselves Christian nationalist or act for you know the kind of the goal or the vision of it will be painted by the regime as extremists and all these sorts of things. So that that is a legitimate concern I have going forward, not you know simply for myself, but for everyone um, kind of in the movement. But uh, as for these other guys, I, th- I think yeah, as we as we move away from traditional religion, I think you're absolutely right. They're going to begin adopting these other types of gods or they're going to elevate one thing above the other and just like you know eric vogel a long time ago would, would say that they they want to essentially bring heaven down to earth um as, in the form of some sort of social justice or political movement and it, it's not i i don't always like saying that wokeism is a religion i don't think that's always as as helpful to in that descriptor but it, it is filling but whatever impulse we have for some sort of transcendence, for some higher mission and purpose, uh, and and how it relates and impacts history, uh, I think that impulse is kind of they're, they're attempting to realize it through these these very very social movements and through the administrative state and all that. Uh, and yeah, that that is. And so th- what this requires then is for Christians to have a really solid uh, critique of those movements. Um, and also be willing to smash it, like it'd be willing to smash it as idols and in, in through, through the pro- appropriate political process like you see in uh, what's happening in Florida now. So there's a lot of progress happening through De- DeSantis in Florida along those lines. Uh, but what it comes down to is, is the will to do it. Uh, and one of the motivations for me writing this book was to try to give Christians you know, a Christian, uh, a Christian basis for doing exactly that, a Christian basis for an assertive politics where you don't have to be marginalized, you don't have to, like, submit to the slavery of, uh, like, a sort of slavery of um, uh, before kind of the woke secular regime. You can actually fight back and you can succeed and you can replace. So it's not just the return to neutrality. It's actually saying, no, uh, we're, we're not going to return to the neutralities of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, which just led to where we're at today, but actually kind of return with uh, to uh, fill in the void um, with what we were from the beginning until recent decades. I think probably one of our biggest idols right now is smarts, intelligence, intellectuals. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people out there, especially with, with the direction technology is going in, who are increasingly just, just convinced, whether they want to be or not, that... The smartest will win, and the smartest deserve to win. Uh, back when TV was the most powerful technology, 
uh, it was really sort of like whoever can dream the biggest and best dreams deserves to, to rule the world. And that's kind of what happened. You know, Walt Disney and George Lucas and uh, Steven Spielberg and like all those guys had the biggest biggest and best dreams and had the, the, this huge impact on the world. And America was a place where, where dreamers were rewarded the most handsomely and the sky was the limit for your dreams, follow your passion, all that stuff that itself was, you know, it started to take on this kind of quasi religious character. But right now, um, you know, computation is a lot more powerful than television or the movies. Uh, people are looking to AI, they're looking to, you know, various tech lords in Silicon Valley and they're thinking, uh, you know, technology allows smart people to kind of simulate any other virtue. So obviously intelligence must be the most powerful. Um, I'm, I guess, an intellectual, God help me, right? Like inveterate writer of books. You're a smart guy. You've, you've written, uh, you know, your, your book is, is a nice thick book. It's not, uh, it's not a pamphlet. It deserves a full length treatment. You gave, you gave it just that um, and, and I commend you for that. Uh, but sometimes, you know, there's that little voice in my head that goes like, but who is it for? Who are you trying? Are you mm -hmm. trying to convince other smart people? Are you trying to convince yourself? Are you just trying to like get this down <laughs> so that you actually can sort of look at it and say like, okay, I actually, you know, the thoughts are not just rattling around in my head anymore. Um, Donald Trump is a guy who does not seem to be interested in convincing anyone. Uh, he's, you know, he, he's, he, maybe he can smash some things, maybe not, you know, there's, there's no wall. Steve Mnuchin, the Vax, people have their criticisms of, 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 of Trump, but he's pretty good at smashing people up with words. Um, so, so that's the question for you is, is who did you really write this for? Do you yeah. think it is possible to convince intellectuals that Christianity is actually a good thing for them and for the country? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and your description of of having these ideas rattle in your head, and you just you actually just want to work, it, you know, work it out, and then put it on put it on, on paper. That that's that that is like a. I think that's a common for a certain type of person like myself. That's that's a common motivation. Yeah, I, I knew writing this uh, that I that the the intellectual, the, the people who are kind of the, the thought leaders within my own world in Protestantism would, would reject it. I, I knew that would happen. Uh, I have the benefit of, um, I know, I mean, this sounds like arrogant or something, but the, the, within the Reformed world, within kind of the Calvinist Presbyterian world, they, there's a high interest in kind of like theology, deeper the, like deeper theology that you don't find in, in some other denominations, not all of course, but uh, and so I had the benefit of, of having that audience. And so there's people with like, with above average or, or you know, are very intelligent who um, are kind of gravitate towards that sort of, sort of theology. So in that sense, I had that audience and I was trying to convince them because it, it is a, the theology in the book is reformed. It's, it's Calvinistic, like I said. So I wanted to really convince them, hey, this is your heritage. This is your, this is, um, this is what your kind of forefathers in the faith said. And so those are the sort of people I was trying to convince. At the same time, I knew that probably the theologians and the PhD folks would not openly support what I said. And so I do have parts of the book where I talk about eating right and working out and, and uh, things that I know would set off people who went to university that they wouldn't like reading about. Um, and, that, and that has been successful <laughs> to, to get them to react. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, the audience was, I would think, uh, I, it, was, it was really kind of the above average uh, reader uh, within my world. And it just kind of, from there, it, just, it did go out to other areas as well. Um, and, but I, I see this, and I say this in the book, I, there's, but within any movement or any, yeah, with any movement, there's different people doing different things. So what I'm good at, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm good at it, but if I have any, if I'm good at something, it's good at more analytical, systematic uh, type argumentation. I have like syllogisms everywhere in the book, like things like that. That's what I'm good at, and so I'll do that. And then there's other guys who I'm friends with who are writing books or tweeting or blogging or doing podcasts or whatever, who are better at communicating things to the average guy, who are kind of distilling things that I say down to kind of package it for people who don't want to read a 500 page book, which I understand they wouldn't want to do that. And uh, so, yeah, so there's just a diversity of people um, kind of fighting the fight. And so I just have one part in that. Um, so I'm hoping that, yeah, the, the broad, like the broad, like um, a group of guys who are, uh, and, and gals who are talking about this stuff are communicating different ways and doing different things.
Well, for someone with so many syllogisms, you're triggering all <laughs> kinds of folks on Twitter. I mean, I was just like scrolling through, and uh, it's I mean, it's it's tempting to make light of this stuff, but you know, you got you got pastors and and guys out there uh, tweeting about how Protestantism is going to die in America unless. Um, unless the faithful really start focusing on things like climate change and like systemic mm. racism and like white supremacy, um, you know, I, I understand why they're saying these things. I get the fear, um, but uh, we're already going down that road, and you can just see it um, in your own neighborhoods. You can see it on the internet. Uh, moving in that direction has not been particularly good. For Christianity, well, and so what do you what do you say in response to those kinds of arguments, other than just to kind of point out the obvious? I mean, at a certain point, you know, are these people sort of beyond persuading, or do you think that that you know that that they're just kind of, in a strange way, trying to provoke you into saying something that's going to make them feel really feel better? I, I think for for those guys that you're talking about, who talk about climate change, and I mean. It, it, even, I mean, even kind of the more moderate evangelical leaders, they, they won't talk about climate change, but they will talk a lot about, okay, we won't be woke, but we'll still still talk about a lot of racial stuff. Uh, we'll st still prove to everyone we're not racist. Um, th there's a sense that they, they think that, uh, they don't, I don't think they realize this, but they, they're, they're trying to, they have an attractional model of, uh, of politics, and, which is really kind of a sort of evangelism, but their target audience is our, our coast, like coastal elites, or they're like, uh, you know, um, it's a very minority group of of people, particularly like white liberals in, in urban areas or on the coasts. But the, I don't think they, most of them, I think, don't realize that that's just the minority group. So like, so from 2016 even until 2020 when Trump lost. Uh, you had they just uh, viciously attacked evangelical leaders from Russell Moore and and others just viciously attacked uh, evangelicals or just people identified as evangelical who voted for Trump, which as as you meant in, it said in the monologue was a lot of people. I think it was like something like eighty percent of white evangelicals, I believe it was. Um, most of those people they identify. I don't know if most, but many of those people they identify as evangelical, but they really they probably don't go to church maybe twice a year, may, maybe once a month at best. If anything, that's the sort of people you'd want to be attracted, to, like be attracted to. That, that those, are the, or you know, they, you would want to present yourself to these people who we call nominal Christians who should be attending church, who have some kind of church background, who probably, if you said, hey, you know, you go to church twice a year, you should go every week. They'd probably say, yeah, I probably should, right? That, that you'd think that they would make those people their target audience. That you know, because they are the they're prepared for faith in a sense. They're not against it in principle. They probably affirm certain aspects of the faith, probably with a little bit of error, but, uh, but still, they, they are prepared for faith. Um, but instead, those people were attacked viciously for years. Um, and they did it precisely to, uh, um, to appeal to people who have no interest in, in the faith at all. And you have some rare conversions, but in general, they're very, they're very hostile to it. Uh, so... Yeah, I think it was a it was a it was a, a it was a missed opportunity. They they could have said, okay, we don't agree, we don't like Trump's behavior and this and that, but we understand all you millions of people who are nominal Christians who didn't vote for, who did vote for him. We understand, we hear you, whatever. They had a huge opportunity for evangelism, and they just you know swing and miss. Um, but I, I don't see any the, after Trump won in twenty sixteen. There was. A, a hint of reflection, like I think Russell Moore said something where he was going to go on a tour or something like to talk to people in his denomination. I don't know who he talked to, but it just continued. And even after uh, Trump lost, it's still uh, you you don't get any any hints that just like this the the white working class folks who used to vote for Democrats and now vote for Republican that they are they're still kind of despised and still not this target. So yeah. Um, it's a, it's a great mission field, and I think we're, we're losing that mission field of those people to try to appeal to the wrong people, or the, the sort of people who are kind of far from God in a hostile way. Well, I think despised is, is just the right word for the way, you know, we've gone from deplorable to, dis, to out and out despised. Uh, it's a little bit stronger of a word than deplore, you know, it's sort of like a, a light scolding. Um, 
faced with that. And yeah, you know, you do you do give people sort of like, you know, the take care of yourself, be physically fit, whatever, um, all good tips, all spiritually speaking, what is the most important thing for a Christian in America to do right now, in your opinion, to be ready for what's to come? Uh, yeah, I think the most important thing is, is regular um, church attendance, regular, re- regular Sunday worship. Um, Just showing up. Yeah, go uh, to a yeah um, to a you know a solid church. Uh, worship God on Sundays, preferably if you're Presbyterian, go twice like me, <laughs> so you can be super spiritual. But no, but just attend uh, uh, worship on Sunday. Uh, that's the the first number one because I, I think in the end, what Christian nationalism to my mind, it's not about taking America back for God. It's not, I mean, there are aspects of that, but it's ultimately, we want a nation where people are encouraged culturally um, to worship God. Like that's, that's in the end what it's about. Uh, it's, it's not about like uh, just, you know, taking dominion for dominion's sake. So I think that that's it. Uh, the second thing is um, the commitment to the spiritual health of a um, of family. Uh, it's something all we we can all um, definitely speak to ourselves and do better. Uh, that I think that's those are the the first two things, and I don't say that just to be pious. I you know I have all sorts of failures myself, but I think that's where it begins. Uh, but that's still not sufficient for a political movement, even though it's essential for it. Um, and and uh, so, but but from there, I think that Christians need to get together uh, within like no, local networks, people within trusted groups perhaps in your church, uh, not just online, but in local groups where they can talk about these things and see how they can, they can act kind of locally. That's at the very local level and the very personal level. And then, and then from there um, and, and elsewhere, I think also encourage the states to as, assert their power. Um, in our federal system, the states have. The, the, uh, I like to tell people that the power of our states in terms of political power, it is... Uh, it is curtailed because of the federalism, because of the powers of the federal government. But that power isn't derived from the federal government. As if, yeah, I mean, that, that the power of the state governor and the state legislature comes from the people. They vote in the legislature. They vote in the governor. Um, the governor is not delegated from the president or, con- or U.S. Congress. Um, that's your state legislature. That is your um, that, that is your governor, and so. They have power, and I think they should act uh, accordingly uh, and act with that power. Don't, don't think of themselves as delegated from the federal government, um, which could at times mean resisting things that are unjust at the federal level. Um, so that, that's just, you know, those are the two things. Act locally. So, you know, worship God, uh, act locally with, uh, and, and meet with fellow like-minded believers and of, across, of, of, across the nominations and all that. And then encourage states to be to use their power um properly show up at church that's like the the woody allen option right life is <laughs> life is 90 percent showing up yeah um <clears throat> rights also don't come from the government uh as uh, you know i'm not the first one to make that that observation but i am mm-hmm. curious um you know reading reading through the book and thinking about you know what what direction you want to go in uh the first amendment um is mm-hmm. was it a, mis- a mistake do you do you like the first amendment <laughs> I, I'm accused a lot of not liking the First Amendment or the Constitution. My, my whole my whole vision is to tear up the Constitution. No, that's that's not the case. Um, no, I, I love the First Amendment. And uh, what's interesting about the First Amendment is that the first word is Congress. Uh, it doesn't say states. It doesn't say local government. It doesn't say your local high school football team. Uh, it says uh, Congress, and I understand the jurisprudence through the 14th Amendment and all that, but um, I think we should keep in mind what early America with regard to religion was all about, which is that there were several quasi-establishments early on until the 1830s. Uh, there was a sense in which we were a Christian country, and there was Supreme Court cases where it says we are a Christian uh, nation. Uh, and so the First Amendment, it did not, uh, as originally intended, did not establish the sort of secularism that we've seen past the, the war in court after World War II. That was all... In fact, contradicts I think the very tra- our tradition of religion, but yeah, the, the the First Amendment with regard to religion it constrains Congress. Uh, that's the original intent. So that's why the states had a hand and uh, a part in religion. That's why there was there were Sabbath laws, there were blasphemy laws, um, 
uh, at, this, at the state and local levels. And it's certainly the intent was not to, well, I forget the court, the court case, but there's that, that, that case where the, uh, a, 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 a football, a local football, like a high school football team wanted to pray or they wanted to pray before the actual game. And that was deemed to be unconstitutional because it was established religion. So of course that's not what was originally intended. Um, and so I, I, I want to return to the older Jewish ju jurish, that jurisprudence of, of, uh, of saying that, yeah, the states can actually, in a way, encourage um, and regulate, in a way, religion. Um, and and it, it just constrained the federal government. So free I love the first free, amendment. Free exercise. You didn't say free exercise. So let's go, what's going on there? So, yeah, I mean, free exercise, I, I think, that, like, the original intent for free exercise was was to uh, not allow the, uh, the, the, the federal government to dip into the states to restrict the free exercise of religion within the states. So that still was a constraint on Congress and not, uh, and not a constraint on the states. And you had different states with different, you know, some of them established churches, some of them not so much, but clearly, yeah. you know, there, there was a lot of sectionalism religiously speaking in the early Americas. And I think, yeah. you know, as, as we touched on a little bit, that's, that has continued um, to yeah. the point where, you know, there are some, some sections of the country that are probably not majority Christian. Um, and uh, when, when you're confronted with those kinds of challenges. Um, yeah. Well, you, but I, I should say, if I can say, like sure. the, so I think what, so I, I do think there is a, like a tradition, like, so you have the, the American tradition itself as its own self-understanding is that we, we support religious liberty. So I think in principle, the states can actually do a lot uh, in, in religion. Uh, the states can do a lot according to the original intent. Uh, but the actual American tradition itself, if we're committed Americans, should actually constrain our own action just, just by appeal to the, who we are as, as a people. Uh, I don't think that means we then become a post, like a war in court sort of secularism. But it does mean that it's probably a bad idea to stab, to make a, a, an official formal establishment of Presbyterianism in, you know, in the state of North Carolina where I live, or or whatever it would be. Um, the, but at, at the same time, there um, that we we shouldn't think that that we founded this secularist nation, where uh, in, in the sense that religion is absent of official public life. Sure. I mean, where where I'm going with this is uh, when when the founders were putting it all together. Uh, they were clear and I think very well convinced that, that the Americans were one people. Hmm. Yes, there were sectional differences. Absolutely. Yes, this was you know, a sprawling landmass uh, that was pretty underpopulated in some areas. Uh, but it was important to them that this was one people. And I think it's fair to say that they would not have bothered trying to uh, found the constitutional edifice um, had they felt that there wasn't a, a, a firm foundation of one people to build on or to conform the regime to. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, things are a little different now. So we spent yeah. the first half sort of talking about, you know, is America Christian enough for Christian nationalism? So now maybe we can talk a little bit about, is America a nation enough anymore for Christian nationalism? Uh, what, yeah. what reassures you that we are hanging together enough as one people, as a nation, in order for this project to work? Yeah, that, that's also, I mean, you, you see people talk about how we're actually more of an empire than a nation. So that, that is, a, it is an issue uh, and, and can't get, uh, it's not easy to answer. I think that the first thing we should, we should address, though, is whether or not that is true, that there was a sense of we're one people at the founding. Because you'll often hear, oh, it, that, that wasn't the intent, there wasn't one people, it was a bunch of different regions and... We weren't actually one people. Um, I do think there was a sort of an American ethne that arose where there was a unity along those lines. You see it uh, famously in John Jay's Federals 2, where it mentions common, common language, common culture, common religion, common struggle. You also see it in George Washington's farewell address. Uh, near the end, I, I read it as George Washington saying, I'm done, I'm retiring, I'm, I've done enough for you people. Um, I'm, I'm no longer going to hold it together, uh, this country together for you. You have to do it. And so near the end, he says, very similar to what John Jay says in Federals too. He says, we're common religion. We have common religion. We have um, common customs, common culture, and a common struggle. So the war brought people together. 
and uh, we are a people, we are Americans. He, he explicitly says that you should call yourself American before you call yourself Virginian or whatever. Uh, so I think that the, the claim that we weren't really a people, a sort of ethnic, I think we were sort of like, a, we became an ethnic group in the early 19th century. I think the, that that is true and the claim the contrary is false. And so within our, our American tradition, there is, I think for most of our history, a sense in which we are a people and those who arrive ought to kind of conform to that, that peoplehood. So there was a, the principle of assimilation was conformity. It wasn't melting pot. It wasn't pluralism until very recently, up until I think the 1960s. I think the governing um, sense of assimilation was conformity. So I think we should first of all keep that in mind, that our tradition is one of a conformist, conformist to a very open and universal and tolerant uh, nation. Uh, that, that being said, I, I think that one of our struggles now is that the, the, um, the level of diversity means that there is, we're kind of back to that point where we need to sort out kind of who, who we are. Like we have to, this is one reason why I think that immigration should be restricted uh, to very, very low numbers. Uh, not because I have anything against the sort of people coming here, um, but precisely because we need to figure out, given the diversity, kind of what we, like who we are as a nation. Are, can we become a nation? Can we come together and be one people? Because there's so much such a division uh, amongst diff different, different parties and just, uh, just eth ethnically, you can see how it breaks down um, uh, politically. And uh, so, yeah, so I think we, we have to then stop and we have to then start, you know, uh, sorting out who we are as a people and to kind of become, again, one people. And where does that lead us in terms of Christian nationalism? Uh, it, that's, uh, again, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a great question um, where, where we're leading. But I, I'm, I'm trying to, and we're trying to uh, set up a vision. I don't have a, I don't have a solid um, plan. Like, it's hard to predict what sort of people we become once this kind of amalgamation becomes one. Uh, and but um, I, I, as Christians, we we should we should first lay out the principles for becoming a Christian people and maintaining that peoplehood, uh, and also be assertive enough to make it happen. Well, there's a lot here, and I'm, I'm going to try to try to unpack it a little bit. Uh, one argument is, well, we were a nation, and then we became an empire, and we became an empire because some people with an ideology took control of our country, of our government. Mm of our education system. <clears throat> they marched through the institutions, they got the, their hands on the controls, and they imposed their ideology that turned America into an empire. And there's some evidence for that, sure. Um, you see it in the way that we swung really quickly from a sort of assimilationist model to what we have now in the 60s. Um, you see it in the way that we behaved around the world. You know, the, the catchphrase that people throw around is, it, it was a model of invade the world, invite the world. Um, yeah. <clears throat> there's another, uh, there's another way of, of trying to make sense of this, though, which is, um, well, actually, the United States was just pressured over time to become more like other countries. We escaped from the old world. We abandoned all of the sort of religious wars of the old world. Uh, we abandoned the model of the, the British, which was, well, we're going to combine spiritual and temporal authority under one figure, sort of the Hobbes model, the you know, King of England model. Uh, we left all that behind. We had these nice big oceans. Uh, yeah, there was some trouble in the interior, civil war here, you know, Indian massacre there, uh, but, but a different sort of problem in terms of political theory. Those kinds of problems were terrible, a lot of people died, but it wasn't just recreating, getting stuck in the patterns that had beleaguered the old world for so long. <clears throat> but then time goes on, the frontier is closed, America gets sucked into these sort of foreign, you know, whether it's, whether it's Cuba, Spanish-American War, uh, or what, what was going on with the Japanese later on, um, America seemed to be uh, unable to fully escape the gravitational pull of the old world and its political and theological problems. And so under that pressure, uh, uh, Spanish-American War, now we have colonies, we give most of them back, but there's still some lingering. Uh, world War I, you know, that's obviously pulling us back into Europe in a big new way. Uh, Wilson comes along, wants America to be the guarantor of democracy in the world. Uh, make the world safe for democracy. 
uh, the original plans in Treaty of Versailles were to have like little American protectorates and part of the parts of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, that didn't pass, but lo and behold, World War II comes along. Uh, then we're really off to the races. We got the Cold War. We got uh, the War on Terror, and here we are today. And s that form of development really isn't necessarily reducible to well, the wrong people took charge and they imposed our ideology on us. Um, it seems like. America sort of became a victim of historical circumstance, where it became harder and harder for us to remain just a nation on the other half of the world, not getting caught up in the business of the old world. And so if you look at what an empire is like in terms of its, its structure uh, yeah. as a regime, um, it's not just the kind of regime that goes around conquering other people and annexing territory. Really, the essence of an empire is that it's not one people, it's many peoples under one sort of, one form of rule. A form of rule that has to um, make allowances for the fact that there are all these different kinds of peoples, that they're never really going to congeal into one union. And I think this, you know, this is a way of explaining why it is that immigration has been just, in spite of it all, all the conflict and e-verify and build the wall and everything, it's pretty much just been open borders and that there seems to be no end in sight for that. We'll see if Trump returns and builds the wall twice as big, uh, but there's reason for skepticism. Um, there, are, there are these issues with, with uh, declining birth rates. Um, when you have this kind of big polyglot regime, uh, people break off into different groups, um, they become increasingly sort of inward focused uh, especially with a smartphone in everyone's hands. Uh, people are consumed with commercial activity. Uh, there isn't that sense of, of togetherness where you know you want to have lots of kids because everyone kind of looks the same and talks the same and acts the same. That's kind of broken off. Um, and so I think in some ways, you know, yes, we're, we are experiencing the negative effects of a sort of bad ideology pulling America, twisting it away from what it once was, which was a nation. Um, destroying the institutions that, that unify people and, and encourage assimilation. Uh, but I'm also, you know, I'm nagged by the, the historical sweep um, of events that, that did seem to just keep pulling America back into the predicaments of the old world and pulling us deeper into that kind of territory where this is a, this is a continent straddling country, uh, it's a commercial republic, and that large size and that commercial energy uh, and the, the way that advancing technology became so important to America's purpose and sense of itself, all of that stuff kind of conspired to bring about this imperial structure that's really hard to break. So, you know, this is all kind of a way to, to build up to, the, to a question of, um, of what to do. You have a quote in here about how St. Paul's, Paul's silence on revolution can't be construed as a denial of its permissibility, very, very lawyerly language, which I appreciate as a recovering lawyer. Uh, you do say, you know, if revolution's unfeasible, Christians should patiently wait on God for deliverance. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but then you go on to say, you know, we are dead inside, lacking the spirit to drive away the open mockery of God. We have the power and the right to act. Let us train the will and cultivate our resolve. If we are stuck with a systemic problem in our regime that has turned, that sort of hardened this imperial character into the country, and it's not just a matter of dislodging these ideologues and replacing the ideologues, but it's, it's a problem with the structure of the country, something that can really only be fixed by maybe breaking that structure and returning that kind of Republican form of government. What kind of guidance can you give us on that? When, when do you think Christians will know that the time is ripe to, um, to really mobilize in a way that you know, is not, not marching on the Capitol or sort of going out into the, into the field with your breach letters and waiting for the red, you know, that, yeah. that stuff. Even if that felt good, it still, it doesn't really work anymore. That's not how you can do it. But it, you're right, things do seem to be coming to a head. People are starting to have these questions. You don't wanna wait until it's too late, but it's not clear what even an effective kind of mass political organization to really start breaking those those chains of of of, uh, of imperial governance would look like. Do you have Do you have any special insight that you can share about how to break those <laughs> chains? Oh, um, uh, well, it, when I say I so saw like the idea of training the will, training like ha having this resolve, it's really a matter of having seen when the opportunity opens, then uh, taking like seize the moment, like seize, seize the day. 
uh, writing that chapter in Revolution, it was is one of the, one of those the, the tendency for for an academic is to say, well, yeah, you can revolt, but you really don't want to do that. I'm just just an intellectual exercise. So near the end, I, I instead of doing one of those, I did say, look, if it's not feasible, you, you're going to go to jail. I mean, it's just it's, you're going to die. It's just it's dumb. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but if you if, if there is a sort of moment for you to uh, have a sort of regime change, then you should you should uh, take that moment when when conditions are tyrannical and unjust. And it's a if it's a just um, regime change, then it's uh, and you think that the effect of it would be good, that, that this is where you, there's landmines all over the place on this question. Uh, I mean, mo most revolutions, most regime change, forget revolution, I mean, most regime changes in, in the country, it's a pretty bad track record for that being successful. And we can point to many, you know, hundreds of examples across the world. We, we happen to be, uh, within the Anglo-American tradition, have two revolutions that, you know, the Glorious Revolution and the American Revolution actually ended up pretty good. Um, but everywhere else, it was pretty bad. Um, so it's uh, it, it, it's. But at the same at the same time, uh, if if we are in this unjust tyrannical condition, if there is like like you said this sort of empire, and there is an opportunity to say no, we're going to change this. Uh, we're going to we're going to fix this. Then then we should seize that that uh, that moment. But you can only do it if you're ready and prepared uh, to do it. If, and so I see part of my job is part of my role is to say, look, as Christians, you can do this. But we're not ready right now. Right, <laughs> right now? I mean, do you, do you no. think that we sort of have the, the strength and vitality and <laughs> devotion and, you know, are, are, we, are we in a place, to use uh, New Age California language, are we <laughs> in a place right now where we're ready to take on that responsibility? <sighs> Sounds like I, we need to skill up. I... Yeah, no, I absolutely, we, we need to relearn our, our founding principles. We need to relearn our, our, the principles of our faith. Uh, so there's, we also have to, um, I mean, if, if, we, if, if we can barely get off the, the couch because we're, we're too overweight or something, that, that's another problem. I mean, what we, if we can't kind of train our own individual selves to, to, be, to pursue greatness, then it's hard to see our nation be able to do that as well. So I think there's there's a lot of work to do within minds and bodies to prepare for something. Uh, and but really, I mean, the, the best option would be through our own political system. Of course, it's we have a constitution that is a good constitution. We have means of electing officials to the proper places. We can appoint judges that can do great, uh, do work for us. We can, we can actually vote to curtail the administrative state. So we have all the constitutional means to uh, achieve that. And so when I say like we should have this assertive will, uh, it, it's, it's primarily saying within our own constitution, we have, uh, it's, we're not, we're not, it's not inevitable that it wasn't inevitable that we'd end up where we are today, given our constitution. We can actually return to something. Um, yeah, I mean, not only not only return, but also push forward. Um, and we have federalism. I mean, you know, yeah. you talk about the differences between the old and the new world. Like you go and look at all the European revolutions that failed and failed and failed, yeah. and they keep having revolutions, and they're probably not done yet. I mean, you look at I mean, whether it's Israel. You know, they're going through this. France is always, always seems to be on the brink of a civil war these days. Uh, Russia had this little momentary uh, uh, rebellion that may or may not have been been the real deal. Uh, but in all of those instances, these are small countries, and mm -hmm. even in a country as large as Russia, you know, a lot of the power is just concentrated in one spot. And the model of the old world revolution is if you find yourself in a situation where you're really suffering under a tyranny, you've you know sort of checked all the boxes, like the founders of a long train of abuses, we tried to be nice, we asked politely, yeah. we warned you, we did all the things and none of them worked. And so you've pushed us into this corner and now we're gonna, we're gonna uh, embark on a just revolution. Even if you check all those boxes in the old world, chances are you have one option, which is to march to the Capitol and try to just like get into those buildings. And yeah. that doesn't, you know, usually doesn't end well. Um, here yeah. in the United States, we have a large country and we have federalism and you don't have to march on the Capitol. You don't have to try to occupy the buildings. You don't have yeah. to try to set up the barricades and the, you know, that whole kind of theatrical pressure cooker 
uh, that even, you know, Karl Marx was like, well, it, it, history repeats itself as farce. And you can see why under those kinds of circumstances. Here, you can go to your governor, you can go to your state legislature. And there still are in the US a number of states, I think, where state legislatures are strong. People understand sort of like what circumstances we're in, what the stakes are. You got governors who actually have some ability. These sheriffs can do things. I mean, there's, there's still, you know, the bones, and in many cases more than the bones, of state and local government that allow people who are faced with these kinds of predicaments that are real and will probably never go away until the second coming of Christ to take some kind of constructive action that is an intermediary step, but is also like a foundational step. And if you don't take care of that stuff and you think that you can just like get your convoy together and drive to the Capitol and then everything will change, you know, it'll be a rude awakening. Yeah. And I, and I just want to like Florida, what, what DeSantis and the legislature there has, has done, it's, it's a good example, somewhat of like a, a, a like small steps, um, but with their, I forget the bill that they say it's don't say gay bill or whatever, but, um, with that bill where they said they can no longer kind of push gender ideology and, and LGBTQ ideology on, on students, uh, there was, I think there was a protest a few days ago about it in Miami. Um, I just, even the Wall Street Journal is writing a, uh, writing a, a, a news piece uh, that I read today that was pretty much quoting all the teachers who are bemoaning, I can't even teach anymore. Uh, that's the kind of thing where what I mean, have the assertive and kind of the will to say, well, it's too bad. You're not going to you're not going to teach that there's more than you know, two genders. That's it. Uh, and being willing to just say, we're going to establish that in law. Um, and if you don't like it, then you can move to a different state or do something else. Uh, and that, so in that sense, Florida, like standing firm on that, that they even moved that. I think it, it originally that don't say gay bill, which I knew the original title but uh, it was from kindergarten to third grade, and then I think the the, the board of or the board moved it to all the way to twelfth grade. So this ability to say, you know what, there's going to be people upset about it, but that's yeah, too bad. Uh, Gavin that, Newsom certainly isn't uh, worried yeah. about having that same kind of effect on people. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. got a minute left. Um, I'm gonna gonna save the the most obscure question for last <laughs> uh, for the real theology heads out there. A uh, lot of Calvin in your book. Um, where's John Knox? He's a Presbyterian <laughs> guy. Does he have anything important to, to contribute to this? Or is he, is he to you ultimately just kind of a, a secondary figure? That, that's a surprising question, uh, John Knox. Um, yeah, so John Knox is famous for saying, give me Scotland. Uh, he was an exile to Geneva, um, a Marian exile. Uh, and he spent years in Geneva, trained in the Geneva Academy, uh, knew Calvin and Beza and all those guys. And then um, he eventually returned to Scotland and was part of the, essentially the Reformation, key figure in Reformation Scotland is, you know. So, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think I do quote, uh, quote Knox. Um, maybe that's an oversight. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I should have. Um, the sequel is no doubt coming, coming very soon. The sequel would be with Knox, soon. yeah. Uh, I will leave it there uh, because after all, there are zeros on the clock. That's literally all the time we've got, at least until next time around. If you personally found this conversation extremely meaningful, please consider becoming a Blaze TV subscriber to help us create more content just like this. Go to blazetv.com and use the code 0hour20. That's Z-E-R-O-H-O-U-R-2-0 for $20 off your first year of Blaze TV. This is Zero Hour. I am James Polis, and may God have mercy on us all.